Joshua chapter number six. Joshua chapter number six. I'm going to begin reading in verse number eight. The scripture says, so it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall you sh say a word or a word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city going around it once. Then they came into the camp. And lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time, it happened. When the priests blew the trumpets and Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So, verse 20, the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both men and women, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the women, the woman, and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in, brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. Today we are continuing in our series, Answers, Biblical Answers for a Broken Nation. And I want to minister to you on a subject that I think will resonate, at least from uh, how much we've been hearing about it, with everybody. And the subject from this very famous Bible story is called Walls and Words. Walls and Words. Haven't we all heard a lot about walls? And haven't we heard a lot of words about the walls, right? We want to know, should we build the wall? Should we build the wall? You know, who should we let in? Who should we keep out? We want to know, how should we patrol the wall? What should we do with the dreamers? All these kind of questions that are being asked right now. Walls are creating lots of words right now, too. The words are flying back and forth. Have you noticed that? The rhetoric is at an all-time high. People are saying whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, to whomever they want, right? It's nasty. Instead of the environment in our nation being one of civility, the environment in our nation is one of hostility. Things are good on an economic front. We are doing great. On the, all the economic indicators are high. But things on the civility front or things on the sociology front are not so good. In, instead of just uh, in, uh, enjoying the prosperity, we are all arguing. We are all fighting. The, the rhetoric is at an all-time high. And so I want to talk to you about what does the Bible have to say about walls and words, but I don't want to teach a political message today. So I'm not going to mention anything that I just talked about. I'm going to talk to you about how your words can bring down walls or how your words can erect walls. Because how many of you know that's what words do? Words either cause walls to go up or walls to come down. Every marriage, married person knows it, knows this. Every parent knows this. Anybody in any type of relationship knows this. We need to use our words to bring walls down. Can you say amen? amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you speak to our hearts? Would you make this message real and relevant to every person? We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. As we come to the text, we find that Israel is about ready to step foot onto or into the promised land 
after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They have escaped Egypt under the leadership of Moses and experienced one of the greatest miracles in the history of the world, and that is the parting of the Red Sea. You remember it? Moses stretched out his rod, and God parted the waters, and Israel went through on dry land, and then when the Egyptians went to follow them through to attack them, God caused the water walls to fall and drowned all of Israel's armies, and the children of Israel escaped Egyptian captivity. They were on their way to the promised land. Most scholars believe it should have took, taken no more than two weeks for them to arrive in the promised land, but because of their doubt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. During their time of wandering, their faith was challenged. It was at a low on many different occasions, and this miracle that God gave them became a reference point. It became something that they constantly looked back to in order to get a faith lift. Matter of fact, every time they wandered from God, God himself would challenge them, and he would say things like, am I not the God who brought you through the Red Sea? He gave them a reference point because sometimes we need reference points when faith gets hard. How many of you know life can be challenging? And when life is challenging, sometimes our faith goes into a little bit of a crisis. And we begin to ask God all sorts of questions, and we too need a faith lift. And what does God do? I'm sure he's done this for many of you like he's done for me. He brings us back to those reference points, those times in our life where we just know God showed up and we cannot deny God's intervention. Times when we look back and we say things like, yep, that should have took me out, but God showed up. Yep, my marriage should have just dissipated, but God showed up. Yep, I shouldn't have walked away from that, but God showed up. And suddenly that reference point to that miracle where God made himself real to you comes shining through. And what happens to your faith that is down, it all of a sudden gets lifted. And so God has given them this great reference point, the parting of the Red Sea, and um, they have been wandering for 40 years. The problem is, during that 40 years of wandering, they've had children. And their children have only heard about the parting of the Red Sea. They never saw the parting of the Red Sea. And so what was a reference point to the older generation is now just some fairy tale to the younger generation. And so now they are literally under new leadership. Joshua has taken over. Joshua, you might recall, was one of the spies who originally went into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. And because he had faith in what God said, God has promoted him. He is now the new leader of this next generation. And they are close to the first city in the promised land, which is Jericho. They've got to cross over the Jordan River in order to get to the city of Jericho and put their foot on the promised land. The only problem is that the Jordan River is at flood stage. And so God says to Joshua, he says, I want you to put your foot in the waters while it's at flood stage, while the waters can take you out if you walk into them. How many of you know that sometimes in order for you to get your promise, you have to step out in faith even when it looks like the situation is going to wipe over you. Sometimes you need to take a step despite what you see. And so sure enough, Joshua takes that step of faith and God gives this new generation their own reference point. He parts the Jordan River for them and so no longer is it about what mom and dad has told me. It's now about what I have experienced for myself. And what is God saying? He's letting us know, listen this generation, you cannot live off of your mama's revelation, off of your mama's faith, off of your granddaddy's faith. You need your own experience with God. And in order to get your own experience with God, you've got to step into the waters of the things of God. And so they do, and the water parts, they go through on dry ground. They are on the doorstep of the Jordan River. Of the, of, the, uh, of the promised land, the doorstep of Jericho. There's only one problem. The city is fortified with these great, big, giant walls. Joshua is one of the only ones alive who's been on the other side of those walls. And so he does what he saw Moses do. He sends in two of his own spies, and they go into the city of Jericho incognito in order to figure out what the military strategy is going to be to infiltrate those walls. And by the way, as an aside, if you're a leader... You need to realize if you've seen something and nobody else has seen that thing, in order for you to get 
the promise, you need other people to see what you've seen. And so what that requires is you to expose them to the vision. This works in any arena of life, whether you are a businessman, whether you are leading a small company, a large company, whether you are leading a family. In order for people to go where you want them to go, you've got to show them what you see. And so Joshua is a good leader. He's been on the other side, but nobody else has seen the promised land except him. And you remember when Joshua went to go check it out, he was only one of two that came back with a good report. He came back. He said, we can conquer the land. God has given it to us. But the other 10, what did they say? They say, we can't do it. There's giants in the land. They didn't know that whenever cowboys meet giants, giants go down. <laughs> Last week was good, wasn't it? Anyway, and so Joshua has now got to send in his own spies to go check out this. So he sends in two of his own spies. And here's what I wanted to get to. And they wind up in the house of a harlot. They wind up in a house of ill repute. If I said it in a crass way, crash way, crass way they wound up in a whorehouse. It's in the Bible. I'm not cursing. I'm not swearing. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Here's what I want you to get. Here's why I said it like that. Because if God is going to do for you what God wants to do for you, some of you are going to have to check your religion at the door. See, because God does stuff in unusual ways, and God does stuff that doesn't seem like it's God, and God does stuff that makes you scratch your head. God, why are we here? Why are we talking to this particular woman? Why is this the house that we're hiding out in? God, why are we here? And not, I want you to notice this. While they're there, they cut a covenant with Rahab the prostitute. I want to read it for you. Joshua chapter 2. This is very relevant to how our words tear down walls. Joshua chapter 2 verse 12 says, Know therefore, or now therefore, I beg you, swear to me, Rahab is speaking, by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. The spies went there. And the soldiers in Jericho, they heard that the spies were in Rahab's house. And so they went to Rahab's house to capture the spies. But Rahab thought quick on her feet. And she hid them in the insulation in the roof of her house, basically. It's called flax. And they hid it in the insulation. And, the, and so the soldiers came. They said, we heard spies are here. And Rahab said, I don't know what you're talking about. And this, I'm not going to explain this, but I'm just going to just throw it out there. It's amazing that this was all part of the plan of God. That God would use a prostitute who lied in order to protect his people. Kind of things make you say, hmm, right? Kind of things that make you say, God, how could God be in that? How many of you know that God can use anything to bless his people? God can use whatever he wants to bless his people. And so sure enough, she tells them they're not here. And the soldiers, they disappear. And this is where we pick up the story here. And she says, show me kindness. I've shown kindness to you. That you will show kindness to my father's house. and Give me a true token. Spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters. And all that they have. And deliver our lives from death. So the men answered, our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for our house was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall. Verse 17 says, so the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless... When we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you have led us down. And in this little portion of the story, we find the first key to our words bringing down walls. If our words are going to bring down walls, number one, we must be willing to talk to those who we don't want to talk to. We must be willing to talk to those who we do not want to talk to. These were Jewish spies. They were following the ways that Moses had laid out. And how many of you know that Jewish people following the ways that Moses had laid out were not supposed to talk with prostitutes? They weren't supposed to talk with prostitutes. They weren't supposed to go to prostitutes' houses. But here we find that God sent them to talk to somebody that they didn't want 
to talk to. And this whole miracle hinges and this whole miracle revolves around the fact that they talked to somebody that they didn't want to talk to. What's the first thing that happens when a wall goes up between you and somebody else? You shut off communication. You don't want to talk to them anymore, right? You want to give them the silent treatment. Or you want to talk about them to everybody who will listen in hopes that word gets back to them that you said what you said about them so that you can hurt them or send them a message without talking to them because what you want to avoid is talking to them. When walls go up, we don't want to talk to certain people. But the only way, and every married couple knows this, and every friendship knows this, and every relationship that matters knows this, when walls go up there's only one way to get the walls down you got to talk to the people that you don't want to talk to and that's the first lesson that we see in this particular portion of scripture God is saying something really really powerful as an aside here I want you to notice one of the things that they say to one another the spies say to her listen we'll honor the oath but in order for your life to be saved when God gives us the city you need to have this scarlet cord hanging out your window. Now this is significant because this was familiar to the Israelites from their time in Egypt. You remember when God sent the death angel to pass over all of Egypt, he told his children that you have to put the blood over the doorpost of your house and when the death angel sees the blood, the death angel will pass over your house. You'll be saved by the blood. Now these same Israelites who have heard this story before tell this harlot that the way she's going to be saved is if she puts a scarlet thread over her house and God is saying something profound to us here God is letting us know that when he puts the blood on something it doesn't matter what it is it doesn't matter what it's done who it is and what they've done when God puts the blood when God applies the blood to your life you go from a whorehouse to a church house in a heartbeat because the blood is on it listen to me that it doesn't matter our behavior is not what saves us Rahab's behavior didn't save her. Rahab's reputation didn't save her. What Rahab decided to do in that minute didn't save her. What saved her, the only thing that could save her was if the blood was over her house. Can I just talk to somebody? Put the blood over everything in your life. The blood will change you. They talked to somebody who they weren't willing to talk to. And the wall came down. Number two. Second thing, if walls are going to come down, we must be willing to compromise in our communication. We've got to be willing to compromise in our communication. Notice that the spies in Rahab make an oath. You do this for me, I'll do this for you. Give and take. Bringing down walls requires compromise in our communication. Compromise is putting aside our differences And making concessions for the greater good. In other words, there are some times, this is powerful, that losing is winning. Wow, that's deep right there. There there are some times when losing is winning. I'll give you an example. Let's say my wife and I are having a disagreement. It starts off insignificant or small, you know, but but both of us want to be right. And so we decide that um, we're going to maintain our position. And so what begins to happen, that small thing begins to get bigger because neither one of us will bend, and suddenly a wall goes up. Now that wall goes up, and now we stop talking to one another. We stop communicating with one another. We stop dealing with one another as husband and wife. Now, in this example, we all know who's wrong. (laughs) It's very obvious, right? But as I see this thing, this wall getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it looks like we are, we are drifting further and further apart, and suddenly the conversation of divorce begins to come up, suddenly I realize I've got a choice in the matter. I can win the argument, or I can lose in order to win. And so the choice for me is very simple. I go to my wife, even though I'm right, and I say to my wife, I want you to know that I was wrong, and I ask you to forgive me. And so I lie for the sake 
of the relationship because I know that losing the fight helps me to win my marriage back. And so sometimes in life, losing is absolutely winning in life. Sometimes we've got to communicate with compromise in order to have a common good come out of it. And this is what we are seeing not happening in our land, and I have a solution for it. This is the only thing political that I'll say today, okay? Here's my solution. You know how we can stop the stalemates in our nation and get Congress to cooperate with one another? Here's my idea. You could take this. If you're watching, you're a politician, you could, you could try to make this law. You get elected for two years. During that two years, we have certain measurables. The economy is part of it. Um, crime rates are part of it. Housing being affordable for everybody. Education in urban communities being as good as it is in suburban communities. And we come up with all these metrics. And at the end of the two years, we measure the metrics. If the metrics are not better across the board, you all get fired. And you can never again run for Congress ever again in your life. And a new group comes in. And guess what the new group is going to do when they come in because they saw the previous group wasn't able to stay in it. They are going to compromise for the common good. It's no longer going to be about making my constituency elect me. So saying whatever I need to say in order to draw favor for them so they'll vote for me. Because listen, unless you realize this, you're going to continue to be part of the problem. Right now, you and I are being prostituted for our votes. But we got to get some compromise in our communication in order for there to be common good for everybody. Let me give you a couple of examples in the Bible of how we are supposed to compromise in our communication. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. It says, speaking of a brother or a sister taking another brother or sister to court. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? What's he saying? He's saying, you know what? Sometimes losing is winning. There's a greater good. Sometimes you've got to compromise for the greater good. Watch this, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 25. When you're on your way to the court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer who will throw you into prison. In other words, sometimes it's better to just cut your losses in the situation. Even if it doesn't turn out exactly the way you want it to, the compromise is better than the end result. Compromise for the common good. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22 says, When I am with those who are weak, I share their weaknesses, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone. Common ground with everyone. Doing everything that I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. You know this needs to be our approach as Christians. You ever see the way Christians approach people who have different views than them? They approach them like know-it-alls. Like they're going to lecture. Like, you know, that's wrong. Yeah, that's not what the Bible says. You know, what? no, you're just going to go to hell if you do that. That, that is not going to bring anybody to Christ. Here's what I do whenever I hear somebody who has a different opinion than me. I think real hard about what is it that they said that I could agree with. And I start the conversation with some type of agreement. Matter of fact, I remember one time, this is, this is going out into left field for a second. I was having a conversation with an atheist one time. An atheist knew I was a pastor, and, and, and so I just having a conversation. I said, I said why, why don't you think that God exists? And they said to me, they said, well, um, because there's so much evil in the world, and if there's so much evil in the world, then there can't be a good God. And, and so, you know what I said to him? I said, I agree. And he looked at me like this. He said, I, I can, he didn't expect me to agree. I said, I completely agree that, um, that if there's so much evil in the world, there can't be a good God. But I have a question for you. Since we both know there's evil in the world, right, and God doesn't exist, I said, can I ask you, where does all the evil come from? And so he said, well, that, it's easy. It comes from people. I said, well, now that we both agree that evil comes from people, can we bring God back into the picture again? See that just back door, right? That's a, just sit right quick like that, right, right there. 
Well, it starts off with agreement, common ground, right? We got to have common ground in our communication. What common ground does is it just, it just opens people's heart. And what we've decided to do in our nation, and, and it's spilling down to us, right? What we see happening in our leadership is starting to spill down to us is we don't want to talk about common ground anymore. We want to draw lines in the sand, but if walls are going to come down, we got to compromise for the common good. Number three, this is my favorite point. If walls are going to come down, we must be willing to wait before we speak. Wait before we speak. I love this about our text. Did you notice what Joshua said in Joshua 6, verse number 10? He said, y'all just need to be quiet, not a word that comes from your mouth, not even a noise. Don't even, don't, don't even burp. I don't even want to hear a burp. No noises from your mouth until I say shout. You know what the correlation is for us? The correlation is just just wait before you speak. There's going to come a time when we're going to say something. And when we say what we're going to say, what's going to happen is the power of God's going to hit that thing and the walls are going to come down. But in order for our words to be powerful, we've got to choose our words carefully. So we've got to wait before we speak. Wait. What does it mean? Why am I talking? Wait. Why am I talking? talking. Wait, wait, wait. James chapter 1, verse number 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. By the way, guys, we're going to talk about this more on Saturday morning when you all kind of come hang out with me. This is one of the scriptures I always show my wife. Because she'll say to me, she'll say, why don't you talk? Because the Bible says, be slow to talk. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, but notice what it says here. It says we ought to wait Wait, wait before we speak. Somebody once told me you have two ears and one mouth. You ought to listen twice as much as you talk, right? Notice also the correlation between talking a lot and getting angry. Slow to speak and slow to wrath. Have you ever noticed that when, when you just get in a talking frenzy, tit for tat, tit for tat, tit for tat, that somebody says something bad about you, you snap back, somebody says something better, you throw shade their way, they throw shade your way, just keep going back. What happens to the anger level? It just begins to escalate, right? Wait before you speak. Waiting before you speak is just smart. Listen to Proverbs 17. It says this. It says, he, verse 27, he who has knowledge spares his words. A man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace, when he shuts his lips, when he is, then he is considered perceptive. Here's what that means. It's better to stay quiet and let people think you're smart than to open your mouth and show everybody how dumb you are. That's basically what that scripture says, right? Just be slow. Don't, you, don't, just, you don't have to respond real quick. Joshua says, I want you all to wait till I tell you when to speak. Joshua is like the Holy Spirit in this. He's the type of the Holy Spirit. Because what does the Holy Spirit do to us when we get involved in conversations that have the potential to go awry or where walls go up? The Holy Spirit is on the inside of you going, over here, listen to me. Shut up. But we just bypass the Holy Spirit. Say whatever we want. Let me give you a couple of keys. How do you wait before you speak? Number one, you need to pause. Just tell yourself, I'm going to pause. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to react immediately. I'm going, to, I'm going to pause. I'm going to be slow to speak. James 1.26, listen to this. This is a powerful scripture. It says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious. Now, this word religious is not how we use it, you know, get rid of your religion, check your religion, it's not, not kind of that, you know, the whole line, you know, I don't, have a, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you remember that one, I remember say that, it's like, you know, nobody understands what that even means anyway, you know, and you go, I'm just somebody in the street, I don't have a religion, I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they're like, oh, I want to get saved now, it doesn't happen that way, right, but this word religion, here's what it means, it means somebody who fears God, Somebody who is a true worshiper of God. That's what the word religion means. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, and that one's religion is useless. Here's what he says. One of the telltale signs of somebody that is a true Christ worshiper, one of the telltale signs of somebody who has a true fear of God is how do they respond do they respond just off the hip, quick, bam? Said that about me, bam. Say that about you. Here's, here's what the Bible says. If that's how somebody responds, he said, guess what? Uh, uh, that's not necessarily a religious person. 
Isn't this amazing that that's in the Bible? Y'all didn't know that because I see the wheels turning right now. Some of y'all are trying to figure out, what are you saying, Pastor, right now? What do you really mean by that, Pastor? Listen, don't interpret it other than what I said. I'm just telling you what the Scripture has to say. It's saying don't respond instantaneously. It's saying pause. Do you know pausing prevents problems? Pausing before you speak, it prevents problems. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23 says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of trouble. Isn't that amazing? That's like, by the way, did you know that that's what we believe in the mafia? <laughs> just keep your mouth shut, you stay out of trouble. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. I'm just playing with y'all. Y'all are like, man, I'm just playing. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 19. <laughs> says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. How do we sin more than any other way that we, we sin? With our mouth. With the things that we say. Because our words, they carry weight, right? We sin in our words. We, we hurt people with our words. We wound people with our words. We, we, our words cause walls to go up. They cause division amongst people. They scar people. Words last. It's hard to take words back. So what is God saying? Listen, because it's hard to take them back once they're out there. Very difficult to pull those words back. Just pause. And then number two, second key for waiting before you speak is ponder. Think before you speak. Isn't that good, good? Right there. I mean, think about how most of us do it. Most of us think after we speak. Some of us think while we're speaking. A lot of people know, a lot of you know people don't think at all when they speak, right? Just put it right out there. Here's what God says. God wants us to think before we speak. And, and one of the times that we get ourselves into trouble is that when we say something without thinking it through. There have been so many times in my life when I've done this. It's harder for me because i got to speak all the time, right? So, like, there's a million thoughts that fly into my head when I'm preaching. And if I said half of them, y'all would never come back to church again. You'd be like, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you said that, you know? I remember one time. There was this, this couple. Uh, the man worked for the school for a lot of years, and then they moved away. And they came back to visit, and they came to church unexpected on a Sunday. And I had heard they had, a, they had a little baby girl, and the baby girl was two. And they came walking down the aisle and up to me to say hello. And I was so excited to see them, and I, I gave them both a big hug. And then I stepped back, and I pointed at the woman's stomach. This is, this is, not, this, this is not just a say. This is a point and say. Just so you know, keep the hand gestures down when you're talking. Just don't, don't do it, right? I pointed, and I said, oh, and you're having another baby. I, I pointed. <laughs> and because I pointed right to her stomach and said that, I couldn't lie my way out of it. <laughs> Look at you looking at me in that tone of voice like, you lie like that? When you say something you don't mean, or you didn't want to, or say you came out the wrong way, you all know you lied through your teeth. I didn't mean that. That's not really what I was thinking, you know. I don't know why I said that. Something came over. Like, like, like you don't do that, right? I couldn't lie my way out of it because I pointed. I was like, I don't know where that hand came from. I, wasn't, that was, I mean, I, there was no good way out of it. And I just wished, I just wished that I had thought that through a little bit. So now, since that time, I have never pointed at any woman's belly in my entire life after that. You know what's good about that? How many of you know when you say something stupid, you ought to learn from your mistake, right? You know, like people can handle it one time, like, and you know, she kind of forgave me. But imagine if every time I saw her, I go, pregnant, huh? <laughs> pregnant, huh? Pregnant, huh? How many of you know after a while, she's not going to forgive me anymore? And some of us, we just, I mean, you just keep saying stupid thing after stupid thing after. And what God is saying, you know, just pause and ponder. Think about it. And here's the thing that we need to realize. We think in two places. One place is easy to access and one place is hard to access. We think from our head. That's where most of us access what we say from. But the other place where we think, which takes a pause and a ponder, is in our heart. We think in two places, our head and our heart. I'll prove it to you. Proverbs chapter, I think it's 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? Luke chapter 2 verse 19, when the angel came to Mary and told Mary she was going to give birth to the Messiah, the Bible says, And Mary pondered all these things in her heart. 
In another place in Scripture, it's over in the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was sensing what was, they were thinking in their hearts. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 4, he says, Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you think evil in your heart? Right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so what happens when we say the wrong thing, right, and we realize it hurts somebody, one of the things that we do to try to take the words back is we say, well, that's really not what was in my heart. I, I, just, I just said that. To hurt you, right? I just said that because I knew it'd get a rise out of you. That really wasn't in my heart. And so what we're doing most of the time is we're speaking from the top of our head instead of the bottom of our heart. Now watch this. Your heart thinks so much that medical science is proving this. Patients who get heart transplants don't only get new hearts, they get new thoughts. They get thoughts from the person that gave them the heart. There was one guy who was 52. He loved classical music, and then he got a transplant from a 16-year-old boy, spent the rest of his life jamming out to rock music. There was a man who got a transplant from a woman. Now, I was going to say he used to ride motorcycles, and now he goes shopping for pocketbooks, but I'm not going to say that. Right? What happened was, I don't care what you say, that was funny right there. Um, what happened was she got hit by a train. And because she got hit by a train, he kept having nightmares about train wrecks. There was an eight-year-old who got a heart transplant by somebody who was murdered. Started having nightmares about the person's murder. In vivid detail, such detail, she saw where it happened, how it happened, and who did it. She saw faces of the person of who did it. And she went to the cops with her parents. She gave such a vivid description that they were able to apprehend the person that did it and put them behind bars. When she got a new heart, she got new thoughts. Here's what you have to realize. How many of you know when you get born again, what happens to you? You get a new heart on the inside. God said, I'll put a new heart on the inside of you. He said, I'll give you a new nature. You'll have a heart of compassion and a heart of mercy and a heart that wants to bear another's burdens. And what happens with us all the time is we get this new heart, but instead of thinking with our heart and talking with our heart, we speak off the top of our head. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we would just pause long enough to think about what we're going to say so that we can deliver a message from the Bible bottom of our heart instead of off the top of our head. Wouldn't that be good? Pause and ponder before you speak. The next thing that helps you to wait, why am I talking? And this is the most important thing, and pray. And I'm going to wrap this into the next point. Point number four, we must be willing to let God touch our lips, right? One of the ways God touches our lips is when we pray. And I'm going to show you this. Six days they're walking around the walls, saying nothing. On the seventh day, Joshua says, shout, they shout, and the walls come down. Now, can anybody shout a wall down? Just like naturally speaking. Anybody have the ability to shout a wall down? No, right? But if God touches your shout, your shout has supernatural ability to do what you couldn't do on your own, right? And so here's what God is saying here. Six is the number of man in the Bible. So six days they try to do it in their own effort. But when they spoke at the commandment of God, God touched their lips and their words had the ability to tear down walls. If we will wait long enough and if we will pause and ponder and pray, guess what will happen? God will give us the words to say, the when to say the words, the how to say the words, the to whom to say the words, so that when the words are spoken... They will bring the walls down. But if we speak right out of the gate in our own strength, all we'll do is cause walls to be put up. We need to let God touch our lips. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Isaiah chapter 6. It's one of my favorite passages because it, it is a passage where a spokesman for God goes to God and has something happen that is extraordinary. Isaiah was one of God's major prophets, 
And in Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1, it says, In the year of King Uzziah, in the year that he died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he, co- he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by his voice or by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me. Watch this. If I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on a second. Spokesman for God. Spokesman to a nation. Gets before God in prayer. And the first thing God deals with the person whose words have influence over hordes of people, is his lips. He said, you better watch it because I've given you a charge to talk to a lot of people. Your lips are unclean. When this really convicted me. This is why whenever I get up to speak, I pray. I say, God, please help, you know, me to not say what I want to say. Help me to say what you want me to say. Because, listen to me, the higher up you go, the more influence you have, the more your voice penetrates the hearts of bigger and bigger amounts of people, the more responsible you are for what comes through your lips. The more you have to watch what comes through your lips. And so here is Isaiah. He's a spokesman to the nation. And he gets before God in prayer. And God says, you're a man of unclean lips. And then watch this. And he said, and I dwelt among the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, the one Uh, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with the coal that was on fire. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Now, if you grew up in my generation, you know, if you're like 20-something, you grew up in my generation, um, or maybe you're younger than me, you remember when, when you said like a curse word when you were a kid? What would your parents do? Make you eat soap. And just put it in your mouth. Now today, you make a kid eat soap, they'll call the cops on you. You'd be like, child abuse. And, and the stupid cops will arrest you for that. The cops should come and stick another bar of soap in the kid's mouth. <laughs> Look at this. Some of y'all don't like that. Y'all, no, 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 no. Anyway. <laughs> I remember when I was little. And I, I, I said my first curse word when I was four. How does a four-year-old learn a curse word? My dad was fixing the sink. I was right there with him, you know. He was, had his head underneath the sink, got my head under the sink. And he heard his hand and he dropped the F-bomb. And I thought it was just a new word. So I went around just dropping F-bombs, just dropping F-bombs, you know, dropping F-bombs. And my mom, she made me eat soap. I said, you better give daddy some soap right there. He's the one that taught me that, right? Listen to me. God doesn't use soap. You know what God uses? Fire. How many times have we heard people talk about being baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire? We actually just talk about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. But we don't talk about being baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Can I, can I tell you what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is supposed to do more than give you a new divine prayer language of speaking in other tongues? It's supposed to create a fire that cleanses impurity from your life. It, it's not a badge to say, I speak in tongues. That's wonderful. I speak in tongues. Like the Apostle Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. But rather in the church, I'd rather speak one word and prophesy that everybody might be edified. Right? So thank God for speaking in tongues. But you know what's even more important than that? Is that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that you have some fire in your life so that there is a cleanliness to your life. There's a cleanliness to your speech. Do you know that before I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I cursed bad. I started when I was four. It just kept going. I mean, for me, the F word was an adjective. If we get around people like that, it's just an adjective. It's like every other thing, and boom, boom, just dropping it, dropping it, dropping it, dropping it, dropping it. And then I got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what happened? A conviction came over me. 
And the conviction was that you better purify your lips. Listen to me. What happens to a lot of people is we try to tell them how they ought to live in a moral way, but they have no experience with the Holy Spirit. When you have a real experience with the Holy Spirit, ain't nobody got to tell you how to live a certain kind of way. The Holy Spirit will just coax you into living that kind of way. And so the, holy, the, the angel touches his lips. His iniquity is taken away. His sin is purged. Then he hears a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Go and tell my people. Did you notice the order of things? Prophet is called to, to the people. Before he can be a spokesman for God and say words to people that will tear down walls, he needs to have his lips cleansed because his words have that much power. What is God saying to us? God is saying to us, we better be careful on how we speak because our words have that much power. Our words have the ability to tear down walls or put walls up. Our words can touch people's hearts. Why is it that the preachers can use words that will tear down the walls that people have put up against God so that they invite Christ to come into their heart? It is not the power of the orator. It is not the power of the mere man. It is the power of the preaching when the word, when God touches the lips of the preacher. Unless God touches the lips, they're just empty words. But when God touches the lips, walls come down. We need to let God touch our lips. Lastly, and we're out of here. We got a little time. Giants play at one. Cowboys don't play till 425. So we got at least four more hours before we have to get out of here. If you want to see a win. Anyway, number five. And lastly, if our walls are going to bring down our Bring down, if our words are going to bring down our walls, we must be willing to embrace the power of those words. Think about the people in Joshua's army. Joshua, what's the strategy here? How are we going to take this land? Um, just, just walk around in silence for six days. Not a word. No, <clears throat> don't clear your throat. Don't burp. Don't whisper to your friend. Not a word. This is silent library. Quiet. Shh. Then when I say, when I give the word, shout, you shout, and the walls are going to come down. Joshua, that's the strategy right there. Just shout. You meant, you meant shout and shoot, right? When you, when you give the word, we shout and we shoot. When you give the word, we shout and we unload all of the military might that we have. We, we, we shout. We unload our military might. We charge. We give them everything we have. That's the strategy, right? Joshua's like, nope, that's not the strategy. The strategy is just shout. That's it. Just shout. Yeah, just shout. Just say the word. Give God a good praise when I, give you the, when I give you the word. And when you give God a good praise, the walls will come down. Joshua, that is the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard in my life. Walls cannot come down with words. Here's what we're, we're hearing right now. We're hearing that, you know what? We need complicated answers to what's happening in our society. I want us to start with the easy answers. The easy answers are simply this. How about we just watch our words and watch the walls come down? How about we start talking to one another with civility? How about we start giving people respect? How about we stop yelling at one another and demonizing one another and calling each other names and treating each other with words? that are kind, that are medicine. That's how walls come down. We need to embrace the power of words. It seems ridiculous, but let me tell you, words are powerful. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. It was their words that brought down the walls that walked them into the promised land. As a believer, do you know your words walk you into God's promises or take you away from God's promises? Your words call for healing. Your words call for joy. Your words call for supply. Your words call for peace. Your words call for, for you to have a, a, calm, a calmness in your spirit. Your words call for all that. And the same thing is true of a nation. Our words call for what we are experiencing. And so in our land and in our lives, we must realize the power of our words words to affect the nation and watch this to affect individuals do you remember Rahab last scripture Rahab she was the prostitute who God used to give the spies inside information on how to defeat Jericho and who hid them her act of kindness the harlot was the linchpin in the miracle I just love that about God 
I don't know why I love that about God. I just love it that God is not limited to what we think he has to use. But here's what the Bible says about her. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6. Watch this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. So far, we're having a, a, an all-boys club here, right? We're hearing about all the men. Watch this. And then it says, Judah begot Perez and Zerar by Tamar. Tamar is the first woman mentioned. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nation. Nation begot Salmon. Not Salmon. Salmon. This is not talking about this dude went to the grocery store and got some salmon. This is talking about the offspring, right? Salmon begot Boaz. Anybody remember Boaz? Ladies, tall, dark, handsome, rich, loves God. I'm talking about Boaz, not myself. Um, <laughs> remember, Boaz. Watch this. It says, it says, Salmon begot Boaz by who? Rahab. By Rahab. Watch this. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David the king. And David the king was where Jesus the Lord came from. Now, now what, what am I saying to you? By the way, do you know who most scholars believe was one of the spies that met up with Rahab when she hid them in her house? You know what the name of one of those spies was? Salmon. Check this out. Come on, somebody. Check out God. God sends two spies into the promised land who decide to talk to somebody that they don't want to talk to, but they talk to the person that they don't want to talk to. The person happened to be a harlot, and they give some kind words to the person that nobody wanted them to talk to and everybody said they shouldn't talk to but because they talked to the harlot the harlot was saved from being destroyed when the city walls fell she was saved from going off into eternity without a relationship with God by the blood that was put over our house and instead the blood changed her life changed her destiny all because somebody was willing to say something to her that was nice Instead of calling her a hoe, they made an oath with her, and it changed her life. What am I telling you? Somebody's waiting on you. Somebody's waiting on you to speak some kind words, some words of affirmation. It may not even be somebody out there. It may be somebody right next to you. Maybe somebody right next to you who, who needs to hear, you still love them. After all these years, I just want you to know, I still love you. After all these years, I, I want you to know that I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it all over again. There might be somebody next to you right now who needs to hear, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of how far you've come. I'm proud of the accomplishments that you made. I'm proud of the choices that you've made. I'm proud of where you're going. I'm proud of what I know is in you. I believe in you. I want you to know I'm for you. There may be somebody that's sitting next to you that needs to hear. You know what? I just want you to know I'll be there for you. I just want you to know I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't know. I, I wish I could explain away or take away the challenges and the pain. I can't do that. But here's what I can tell you. I can tell you that I can walk side by side with you through this thing. I can tell you that I'll be a shoulder to cry on. I'll, I'll, be a, I'll be a person to encourage you. There might be somebody that's right here with you that just needs some words in order to change their destiny. Do you know how words can just alter a person's destiny for the rest of their life? Just the right words spoken by somebody who cares enough to talk from their heart. Listen to me. Here's what God told me to tell you, and I know I keep saying I'm going to close, but I promise I am. Here's what God said. He said, we need to realize that we are part of a greater kingdom. That we all, everybody in here has dual citizenship. Some has more than dual. But everybody in here has at least dual citizenship. And that citizenship is first in the United States we have citizenship. And thank God, 
There's not a place in the world that I'd rather live than the United States. Let's not, let's not, let's not get it twisted. Okay, with all, with all the warts and all the things that we still have to fix, but it's still the greatest country in the world. It's still the best place to live. That, that just is. But I'm also a citizen of a, of a, of a better country. I'm also a citizen of a, a better kingdom. I'm a citizen of heaven. And here's what I've learned in my life, that, that when my citizenships collide and I have to make a choice, do I side with the values of this citizenship or this citizenship? I go with heaven's values every single day time. Here's why. Here's why. It's not because I disrespect America. It's not because I don't love America. I do. But it's because I truly believe that if I will walk in the values of the kingdom here in this world and in this countries, that the values of the kingdom will affect the culture and the country that I live in and make it even better than it currently is. And what we've got to do is we've got to decide to not get swept into the nonsense, we've got to decide to stand out. And one of the words we, one of the ways that we do that is we use our words to bring down walls.